Hey there, hey, it is Michelle with Brilliant Quest. And today we're gonna be talking about something that is um, eating through society like a cancer. And that is money dysmorphia. Yes, money dysmorphia. So I wanna ask you, what is your money enough number? What's the number where you know I have enough? I have enough to make it. I have enough to continue to perpetuate uh, my living and, and propel myself into the future. What's your enough number? And the reason why your big sis is asking this is because this hypothesis, because right now it's not in the DMSR-5, that's the diagnostic uh, manual for psychology and um, for uh, manias and, and different things. Uh, it's not in there yet, uh, but it's a hypothesis that's been going around since around 2014, really started coming into the forefront in 2017. And money dysfor dysmorphia and dysmorphia in itself is where you have a um, obsessive compulsion to see, uh, it's usually dealing with body parts, uh, to, to see part of yourself out of alignment with what is usual, customary, acceptable, and that kind of thing. But money dysmorphia is where people are obsessing over money all the time and they are not truly understanding in reality what they have and when it first started coming to the forefront it was because there were people who were living in high income areas who were making like what the average would say would be in the upper echelons not in middle class we're, we're talking about people that were making millions and who were saying i'm poor i don't have it i can't make it i can't sustain it um and when people started looking the, you know the scientists and, and psychologists and clinical um, uh, psychologists that started looking at it and de de digging deeper they started realizing that these people had what was equivalent to if you had a body dysmorphia where you know there are some, there are some ways of looking at this money dysmorphia that some psychologists are even saying that might be that might be on par with a mental dysmorphia where people they can't see that the money they have is enough and it is horrible in that it is malignant and it spreads out in all these different ways. So you can't just say money dysmorphia is for people who hoard and, and don't want to spend. No, because you can have the same money dysmorphia on people who get uh, pessimistic about their future. And so they're scared to save. <laughs> they're, they're scared to uh, squirrel anything away for a rainy day. And it's horrible because money dysmorphia is now being blamed on the burgeoning debt of society. Now, wink, wink. Money dysmorphia ain't doing all of that. Um, the current situation of how the debt system has has gotten to the point where we must deal with it or else, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say that money dysmorphia for the individual is something that is, you're going to try to blame for a systemic environment, a collective global situation. OK, but I'm going to get off of that and stay on this because it's about you. It's about me. It's about us having brilliant quests. Right. So we're not going to be locked in money dysmorphia. OK, so. Taking an average, all the generations that are on the earth, they've noticed something that if you generalize it, especially in the Western cultures, I live in the United States, they're saying that 30, 29 to 30 percent of the population has money dysmorphia. That's almost one in three. But it gets worse the younger you get. So if you are in the millennial generation, you have a 41 percent chance of having money dysmorphia. If you are a Gen Zer. Oh my goodness, you have a 53% chance of having money dysmorphia. That's more than one out of every two. And of course, right now, and I think it's still too early to really give a definitive, but I'm going to tell you what the research says, okay? And the research says that the reason why there is a higher chance for people to have this obsessive, always thinking about money, always worrying about money type of situation is because of the proliferation of, you guessed it, uh, technology, the internet, uh, social media apps, and the like. And they say that a big, big meanie that is kind of on the equivalent of cancer uh, in the society is the comparison factor. Um, I, have, my, <laughs> I remember now, I have a, a sister who loves to send me things on social media because she knows I don't like social media. <laughs> and, you know, she likes to get my takes on stuff. So she'll send me something and I, I'll, I'll, I'll go look at it and everything and we'll discuss it. Um, but a few years ago, she started sending me something that at the time I thought was pure absurdity. And if y'all have rock with me, you know that I have shown you the, the path. Uh, of uh, by which a concept is spread. So first it moves, it is in the fringes and it is extreme. Then after it moves from there, cause it will, it becomes normalized. 
Mm -hmm. And then once it becomes normalized, it becomes required. And then the next stage after that is it becomes the profane or grotesque. Okay. Think about if you want to get a quick understanding of this plastic surgery, the extreme, it started off to help heal people who had injuries from, um, uh, war blast wounds and things like that. Now this is in the contemporary sense. Then it became normalized through the use uh, by celebrities and people in the public, you know, facing sector. Uh, then it became required. Now that you got you got people thinking, oh, I don't like something about my face. Well, of course I'm going to get a nose job for my birthday or when I graduate from high school. I don't like my my derriere. Of course I'm going to go on and suck the fat out of my stomach and put it in there. You know, just that make it quote unquote required to you know, I guess in these people's minds be counted as um, uh, accepted, if you will. And then, of course, we know the grotesque where you have people who have become addicted and now they look like uh, like lions and tigers and bears, oh my, you know, instead of humans because they've had so much work done. So that's just an example. But when it comes to how to know what your enough number is and dealing with this, pol this, this mm, rampant, uh, diabolical, uh, invisible even, uh, money dysmorphia, it's horrible in that folks are are taking things that you, you that look so innocent and turning it into where people believe they don't have enough. So going back to my sister, she sent me um, some memes a couple of years ago. And like I said, at first I was like, this is crazy. But now two years later, it's required. And that is she sent me refrigerator restocking videos. Mm -hmm. Now they're part of the soft life um, sector of social media where people show you all the cutesy little things that they do to make their life so comfortable well when you look at these refrigerator restocking videos of course they require that you go out and have all of these little um compartments and and you know ways to organize your fridge that seems innocent right yeah well you gotta have something to put in there and so with these restocking videos they started i think innocent enough with restocking stuff that you would normally find in a, a fridge. But then they got to the point where you had to have color coded compartments in the fridge. So everything on this side is purple, everything on this side is pink, everything is blue, and, and so on and so forth. And they showed name brand things and they organized them, and you know, where if you take one, it'll the next one will roll down and all this kind of stuff. And it got to be where people were like, Well, I want that too. Well, nobody, not nobody, a lot of people did not stop to realize just how much it cost to have these quote unquote props because i believe a lot of it was props i was like do you really need that many passion fruit you know just different little things that that they would show of how they would restock these fridges and the, the restocks of the fridges became more and more frequent y'all eating that much high expensive overly processed junk food okay you do you you know because then it moved from the fridge it moved to your um counters i mean not your counters but your cabinets and of course you had to then go get the newest organizer organizers for the cabinets and you you know we're, we're not going to go and show them the store brand of uh chips and cookies and candies no you want to go get the brand names and lo and behold once I, and I, I, if she hadn't shown me, I wouldn't have realized. But I remember going to Costco and Sam's and seeing organizers and uh, on the end aisles and people were grabbing them and everything. I was like, OK, only reason why I know why they're grabbing them is because of these types of videos where the extreme had now become normalized. And now it's almost required. People expect for you to have all these little containers and doodads in your refrigerator when, you know, you know, when they come to your house. Well, I'm going to tell you, I do, I do have some of them. That is my confession. I do have some of them, but they were on sale. And I don't do all that foolishness that they do on there. But they did help me get my refrigerator, you know, organized. Um, but anyway, I wasn't supposed to tell that part. Okay, focus, Michelle. <laughs> but comparison. Keeping up with the Joneses. This is this is this generation's version of keeping up with the Joneses. Money dysmorphia. Because of course, when you're looking at a video, and say for instance, they only restock once a week, but the stuff in the video costs uh, $500 and you're, and you're be believing that, well, this is what normal families have. Everybody has 50 billion could pre sons and they only got one kid, you know, <laughs> just mm, different little things that it became a problem where you ask folks and they're like, I don't have enough. I, I don't have enough. And so this is part of me trying to do my part as your big sis to let's just cut this foolishness out and let's get an enough number. Once you know what your enough number is and you treat it 
with the respect that it deserves, it will help you to identify when you're getting out of a line and when you're getting into the danger zone of obsessing over money. Okay. Now there's one thing, if you don't have money, if you don't have money coming in, that's not, that's not dysmorphia, but if you have steady income coming in and you are like, I just don't have enough to live. We need to look at these areas. And that's why your big sis Michelle is calling them out. All right. So here's the next one. I'm, of course, I'm looking at my notes, y'all. So y'all know what I'm doing here. All right. So because we are now in the age of uh, uh, technology, we, uh, when I say technology, you know, being able to know what people are doing globally, we get an opportunity to brush up against more and more people in, in various lines of work and lifestyle and everything. Do you know? At this current time, Elon Musk is either number one or two, but I know he's in the top two, maybe top three. But he just recently, at the time of this recording, came out and said that he has severe depression and he treats it with ketamine. Now, when the <laughs> richest man in the world tells you that he has depression that is connected with stress, I'm just saying what he's saying, you know it's pretty bad out there, okay? And even our obsession with who's on top, who's the richest. That used to not be a thing. It was a manufactured ranking. Um, shout out to Malcolm Gladwell. Y'all know I got a crush on him. His mind is beautiful. I am a, I am a heterosexual, sapiosexual. So if you have a beautiful mind, <laughs> but anyway, Malcolm Gladwell said something in an interview a couple of years ago about one of um, the biggest hustles around. And if you wanna get rich, start a ranking list and get people to pay you to be on the list, get advertisers to pay you to advertise because people want to see who's on the list and you will make a lot of money. So if you think about it, I'm not trying to call anybody out, but who came up with all of these wealthiest top this, top that list? Who came up with all of these um, uh, conferences and lists for uh, athletic teams? There's a lot of money around the rankings. And so I'm saying that a lot of this stuff that we care about is manufactured. And it's not even that long ago that it was manufactured. You know, some of these lists are less than 30 years old, if, if, if memory serves me correct. That's a short time to turn a whole generation into dysmorphic when it comes to money. So we need to be mindful of that. And because of that, we moved. Now, this is this is the bigger thing. I, if someone had told me in 1990 that there would come a time in the near future, where the seeking of fame and being a millionaire would fall by the wayside, I would be like, you're lying. No, you're lying. 30, well, if you're 90, almost, well, almost 35 years after that, we have moved from people wanting to be famous at all costs, wanting um, to be quote unquote just rich at all costs, to now People want to be wealthy at all costs and they want to be powerful and influential at all costs. So they don't care about the fame. They care about how much they can influence you so that they can get from you. You see? And that was something that I would have been like, well, how can you do that? Well, when you're able, just like I'm recording right now on this phone, you're able to put it out to the world and you have access to a distribution system that used to be uh, gatekeeped. That's how it happens. And it happens faster and faster. And so now we now have one and a half generations uh, on this planet who have never known a life before the Internet. Mm -hmm. uh, the millennials, the oldest millennial at the time of this recording is 27 this year uh, because they were born in 1997. And so um, I'm sorry, Gen Z, forgive me. Gen Z is 20, uh, 27 down to 12. So it was uh, 1997 to 2012 completely, completely online, okay? And then with the millennials, even the majority of their developmental years were spent in the world where there was access to the internet and apps. And because they have to deal with so much more than the older generations of exposure to what everybody's doing everywhere, the idea of FOMO, fear of missing out, the biggest one, the cancer of social media and uh, tech society comparison, they're falling. And we as a, a world are falling into these um, unlivable conditions. I mean, come on, the quote unquote richest man in the world is talking about, I'm stressed. I have, I have clinical depression. I need ketamine. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I mean, kudos to him for sharing his, you know, business like that. Uh, but it's, it's really telling on our society. So you might be saying, okay, Michelle, I know you've talked about that. Uh, 
what is a way for us to you know get out of this well the first thing i'm gonna say is is we have to start doing reality checks the first and foremost thing before we even talk about getting to your enough number is to start putting it on your radar to manage your stuff my sister sent me a video of a young lady who was trying to make a funny and she was talking about all of her different um baggage luggage if you will of uh, designer bags and she was sitting in the airport with all these bags around her she said and i'm going you know i have this this and this uh, and, I, and i'm going to go sit in seat 29c you know um saying that you know she was going to be slumming it in the back and i talked about it in another video um uh, about you know the priority of stuff over the impact of time you know as opposed or versus time of what was more important but in looking at this obsession with wealth gathering up to the point of being crippled about what to do with money and before i forget this point uh research has shown that with body dysmorphia it gets worse because people who have more money than they think they have get into great debt because they have so much money they don't understand how to manage it and thus they're being influenced that I need my refrigerator stock like that too. I need all of these different little doodads that are constantly coming at me from social media for people hawking them. You know, I say, oh, I have this cool little whatever that you rub right here and it is gonna make this part so pretty. You know, those different little things. And so they, they're they continuously um, buying and, 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 and accumulating stuff. And of course it's got to be stuff that has some type of brand name associated with it or, or panache or cachet to it that you're spending that probably in six months time it's not gonna matter and it's gonna be in a closet in the heap of other stuff that that you bought and so you start to manage how much stuff you're actually getting do reality check checks did I actually need this was I out of it did I need to replace it is it something that I naturally needed or was it something that I saw and because everybody else has gotten it I unconsciously am on the bandwagon uh, to be made to feel that I must have it watch that and then the next one is the tech purchase obsession. There is a concept called product obsolescence. And what product obsolescence is, it's where a company will purposefully give a product an end life. It started happening around the 50s. And they only have one story from Time, Mag I mean, from Life Magazine at the time in 1955, I want to say, where they actually wrote about uh, product obsolescence. So what happened was prior to uh, World War II, uh, they bought, um, manufacturers built stuff to last. They did. I mean, there's still some that claim they do. <laughs> they don't. Um, and so they would use the, the best materials that they possibly could while keeping the cost in line. So if you you bought a pot, it's probably going to be cast iron where you can't break that thing. <laughs> you know, if you bought a refrigerator, it's going to be fortified so that it will last 100 years. Shout out to those refrigerators from the 1950s that if you have one and you can get it working, you are set. Uh, you know, just different little things. And they noticed that people have more money manufacturers were like i don't want to wait to have a major purchase every 10 years from from my customers i want them purchasing all the time and so they got together and with the help of bernays and some others uh in the propaganda movement they started decreasing the material so whereas metal became fiberglass for a car uh that same cast iron skillet became aluminum with a few little steel parts in it but then they're gonna put the shiny on it where it don't stick so you'll believe that it's just as good as a cast iron but you know but they know you have to buy them every two years if you cook with them and thus you can't get the cast iron that was your grandma's grandma's cast iron and you still using it no you got to continuously buy stuff well the tech industry got very very uh familiar with that concept and they built in product obsolescence why is it that you need a new phone that costs more than a souped up laptop every 24 months and they took it a step further helping people to get into this mess of, of, of the money dysmorphia, where now the tech industry is the fastest industry learning how to convert you over to what they would call the necessities category of your bills. So you don't just have to have a phone every two years because you want one. No, you need a phone every two years because of product obsolescence through updates that mysteriously, once your phone is like 30 months old, you start having problems where hmm, it don't work as well. And if not that, they come up with apps that require more and more processing power so that they can legitimately say, well, when you bought that two years ago, it didn't move with the speed of tech. So you've got to upgrade just so that you can open the apps that you could use two years ago. But now they do all the whizzles and the fizzles and, and all of these things. And so you need a different processing power that's compatible with those. You see what I'm saying? Do you, do you see how all of it is working together? So there's no wonder 
why people never feel like they have enough money. Not enough. But we're going to get there. All right. So the next thing is I want you to work on a mental game of building. OK, so with this mental game of building uh, to get to your enough number, what we're going to do is we're going to put down uh, the things that it takes to run your life. The thing, uh, the amount of debt it takes to get uh, existing debt off of your life. And we're going to include inflation uh, uh, and, and perpetuating that into the future. OK, so just three little things. And I am going to just give you a quick overview because you can find a lot of this stuff on the uh, on, on the Internet as well. Um, if you if, if possible, I might do a workshop where we just go down through this to do this. But this is how you do it. So if you have a home or if you want to build a home or a tiny house or whatever, whatever you owe for that or whatever you think it's going to cost to build that. You put that into the uh, long term debt. If you got student loans like me. That goes in there. You got credit card debt. That goes in there. If you have uh, other debts, like I've got business loans and, and things like that, all of that goes into that big number. That is going to be a big number. Don't let it scare you. The better you you are at understanding where you are on that debt, it's going to help you. Okay, so those are going to be the big ones. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to take the utilities, all of the necessities that it takes for you to live your life. Now, this is what I will say. Most people are like, well. Uh, we're going to take out all of the different cables and the apps that we pay for. And I'm going to tell you no. And the reason why I'm going to tell you no is you want to know what your enough number is to live the life you want. You only take that stuff out when you're in a temporary austerity plan. What's an austerity plan, Michelle? An austerity plan is a minimalist plan for temporary measures to get you out of serious debt, financial pressure, or to rebuild after you've lost everything. I want an austerity plan, <laughs> but it's temporary because we're not made to only live hand to mouth uh, forever. It will create another type of stress that is really not good for you. And they even have studies that show that it can psychosomatically form in the body in various ways, whether it is attacking your immune system or attacking your body in, in certain cancers and all of that. So we're not trying to do all of that. I really want you to put. So if you want your Netflix, your Hulu, your Paramount Plus, your HBO Max, if you want all of those things, they go into this. Of course, you're going to have to put your tech in there because now your tech is a utility, a necessity utility. OK, so you're going to put your installment plans, how much it costs for you to have your phone, your Internet, uh, you know, when I say your phone, your mobile and then your Internet and all that kind of stuff. OK, then you're going to take your and that includes your regular utilities to live. If you you know, if you not if you're still living on the grid, um, your um, electricity, water, gas, uh, all of those different things, trash pickup, all of that kind of stuff. That's going to go in the, in the middle part. And then the next thing you're going to do is you're going to put in in the, the third section. You're going to put in uh, your uh, your 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 plans for investing uh, and you're going to put in your inflationary percentages so that you can know. Now, once you take that big number of all the big debt, once you take your living expenses, once you take your oh, I'm sorry, investing uh, your LTSS long term savings for spending, meaning if you know in the next five years you're going to need a new car. That's going to go in there. If you know that you've got kids that are going to be going to uh, college soon, that's going to go in there. So all of those things are going to be in there. So in the middle is going to be your necessities that it takes to live over uh, um, and your your first column is going to be all your big debts. And then in your last column is going to be in your savings, in your purchases that you're foreseeing and those kinds of things. You want to add all that stuff up. All right. Then once you add all that stuff up, that necessities, mm -hmm, that middle one, you're going to take it and you're going to times six or 12, meaning six months or 12 months, six or 12. That amount is going to be what you add in to the third column that goes into a savings so that you know, I can never go below this number. But that's not your enough number. What your enough number is, is all of those numbers added up and then your inflation percentage on top of that. So for instance, if you did all of that stuff and you came up to $500,000, right? That's my enough number that gets me debt free, that gets me paying my necessities, uh, and it gets me putting away some necessity money uh, for six months or 12 months. And it includes me being able to buy a new car, uh, pay for a wedding, uh, pay for the college, and all of that, right? You know, you put that there. You're going to uh, put a percentage on it for inflation, meaning 20%. 
you know, so you'll put your 20% on there. So, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> it'll be 500 and uh, what is 20%? 525,000, right? So that is an example of how to get your first enough number. Now, if you notice, that's not the 2 million, the 5 million, the 10 million that people tell you, you got to have to have enough. No, your enough number is going to get you to a point where you're able to become either debt free or smart debt only, where meaning you carry debt, but you have other ways and means for it to be paid, which comes by that third column with your investments and stuff. And that is your first point. I am not saying that that is your end all point, but darn it, stop trying to look for the end of the race, uh, the marathon race of 26.2 miles. You're looking over there when well, you need to make it through the first five miles. So your enough number, your mental enough number for money is going to be, what is that first point just to get me to where I can breathe and I can uh, have uh, the energy to do what it is that I need to do, okay? And using that, that is going to help you because that's part of your building game. And I just wanna say a few more things about this, this game. What I want you to do is, so for instance, if you say my enough number, if you go through all the numbers and you say, well, well Michelle, my number is 750,000. How in the world am I gonna do that? Well, this is what you go do. You are going to start to reframe with tweaks, not overhauls at first. So the first thing is, is you're going to think it. You're not going to just try to think it through. You're not going to try to gather all this information. You're going to act and think as you go, meaning you're going to start trying to figure out how to I, how do I generate uh, more income to go towards fulfilling my enough number. You see, once you have that enough number, you now have an ability to skirt falling into money dysmorphia. You now have an ability to, to be circumspect when you're watching videos and you can now say, oh, that's a cute thing that they have their refrigerator organized. That's not for me right now. That's not in my plan. You know, it helps you. And it's more reachable instead of saying, oh, they say I need $5 million to live on or I'm gonna die. You know how they tell you, you don't have enough money to retire and all this kind of stuff. No, we're working with our enough number because by the time you get to your enough, enough number, guess what you're gonna do? You're gonna do your next enough number and you're going to leapfrog your way where you have a better uh, pr pr propensity or, or ability to get to that two, five million or whatever, instead of being obsessed with it. Um, so then you're going to uh, explore your curiosity instead of perfection, meaning be adventurous uh, with what you do to generate new ways of income, new ways of reframing where you are. It might be for some of you under the sound of my voice that when you go through and you do your enough number, you're like, wait a minute, I'm closer to it than I thought. There could, that could be bad. And then the next thing is, is you're gonna experiment before you create. And to experiment means that you give yourself permission to mess up. And you want to be in what they call spew mode, meaning, you, you know, you just spew out what it is that you want to do and not try to be so specific to create something that has to be perfect or has to be readily consumable once you've ta da it, you know, be willing to um, do that and, and stay out of edit mode because when you create, you must edit. But when you spew, you can experiment. All right. So guess what? Yes. I want you to watch this next video. And don't forget to comment, subscribe, like share hit the notification bell and i um i want you to check the links in the description uh if you want to do a one-on-one -on -one with me we can work through you know if you want to get your enough number i can walk you through that or you know other little life uh things that you want to talk about or if you want to go on to the other side and talk with me you know we can do some oracle stuff and you know see see what life has in store for you you can do that as well i'm in my office and i'm noticing now that my blinds have got lines on my face so uh i apologize for that but you can still see me right anyway I'm going to go on and uh, see you sooner than later. And I thank you. This has been Michelle, your big sis with Brilliant Quest. Bye.